welcome to the Med Control Monthly Podcast, brought to you by the Oakland County Medical Control Authority. This episode was recorded on August 24, 2022. The Oakland County EMS system is made up of 49 EMS agencies and 15 hospitals that serve about 1.3 million residents, with approximately 250,000 calls for service each year. It requires a constant stream of high-quality information to support such a robust and busy system. The mission of Med Control Monthly is to provide the latest updates, information, and trends to and on behalf of Oakland County MCA's EMS agencies and hospitals. I'm Jeff Lassers, and I'll be your host. I'm the EMS System Manager of the OCMCA, as well as a full-time firefighter paramedic with the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department. In today's episode, I am joined by Bonnie Kincaid, the Med Control Executive Director, and John Toit, our Medical Control Authority Quality Improvement Coordinator. Bonnie and John are here to provide an update regarding the OCMCA Roadshow, which is a program designed to connect directly with our EMS agencies and providers to educate them on the system. More importantly, it's a great way for EMS providers to ask questions and speak directly with OCMCA staff. Then Bonnie and John will walk us through two new protocols. Protocol 838, EMS Provider Criminal Charges and Convictions, which was implemented on August 1, 2022. And Protocol 1-12, Citizen Assist, Lift Assist, which will be implemented on September 1, 2022. We'll cover both of these protocols to make sure that all agencies and providers understand them clearly. I have one final bit of eBridge housekeeping before we begin. The OCMCA recently launched updated how-to guides and videos on ocmca.org slash eBridge. You can stream or download any of these resources to learn or teach how to use the eBridge application for all EMS to hospital communications. Again, check out OCMCA. Dot org slash ebridge for more information. Finally, check out the episode description for additional information and links related to today's topics, as well as a list of today's guests. Thank you for listening to the Med Control Monthly Podcast, providing the latest updates, information, and trends to and on behalf of Oakland County MCA's EMS agencies and hospitals. Now enjoy the show. All right, Bonnie, kick us off. Let's talk about the OCMCA Roadshow. What is the Roadshow, and why and how does the OCMCA facilitate them? Well, the Roadshow really is to get out there and talk with the actual crews, not just EMS coordinators, not just administration. We really want to get to the people that do the work on the road every single day and answer their questions, really specifically answer their questions about what they think about protocols, state law, PSRO, the MCA in general and how they fall under the MCA. Because a lot of personnel, they don't even know that, that they work under the Medical Control Authority and have a privilege to do so. And so we decided to kind of put together a PowerPoint to answer all those questions. But then we really kind of just say, what do you want to know? We have a really good program, but we want you to ask the questions so that we have the answers for them. John, what else? We do it because a lot of providers have questions and have always had questions on why we do the things we do. Why do we write reports for specific types of patients? And we come in and we answer with the state law and the Oakland County protocol, national standards. We let you know what is law and what is recommendation and what is best practice so that the agencies can make decisions on what directions they want to go with their policies and providers have a complete understanding on why those policies are in place so they can better do their job and they understand the rationale behind it. We started this about a year, year and a half ago. We have so far been to 13 life support agencies to date. We have more coming up today and next week and more scheduled into September. And we go out multiple times to some of the LSAs so that we can hit all of the personnel while they're on duty. And that really makes it much easier for the agency. It's worked out really well. We've gotten really good feedback so far. So with 49 different agencies in Oakland County operating as EMS agencies, those are private, those are municipal, those are fire-based, those are all EMS-based, those are professional, those are semi-full-time. There's a huge spectrum of agencies and providers that occupy the Oakland County EMS system. I would say that although we have the same high level of care, we work with the same protocols, 
going on calls where I work is different than where John used to go on calls is different than where my buddy Bob down the street in a totally different city goes on calls. So I could imagine that this conversation tends to mold to the conditions of those providers and elicits more details because a problem or a solution in my neck of the woods might be different that you face somewhere else. No. Absolutely. And that's why we have a written format that we go in with, but we go, all right, this is for you. What do you want to know? What are your barriers? What are your questions? What are your resources? And we go from there and answer the questions they have. For the most part, we have a PowerPoint, but all that PowerPoint is, is a conversation starter. Once the conversation starts, we don't care if we touch the PowerPoint again. Fantastic. And if I'm an EMS coordinator, or even just an EMS provider going on calls, and I think this would be valuable for my agency, how can I go about getting the OCMCA to do a roadshow for my crews? Reach out to the EMS coordinator, have the EMS coordinator get a hold of us, email us, call us, whichever, and we'll schedule it. And we try to schedule it around their time where they're doing trainings. So if it's, you know, eight o'clock in the morning or if it's six o'clock at night, we try to work it into our schedule so that we can hit those times and dates where they're actually doing training and make it easier for the life support agency. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. We got a couple of protocols to discuss in this episode. Let's talk about the purpose, policy and procedure of protocol 838, EMS provider criminal charges and convictions. Bonnie, when, why, and how was this protocol developed and implemented? It was implemented on August 1st of this year. So just earlier this month, it went out, but it has been in protocol forever, but it's been buried in a PSRO protocol where most of our providers don't even go to in the protocol manual or the app. So we needed to make it its own protocol. So we did so, we created it, we developed it, we got it up to the state, got it approved, and it was implemented just a few weeks ago. Yeah, John, when you came onto the OCMCA as the Quality Improvement Coordinator, one of the first things that was identified during our collaboration with the state of Michigan was that although this requirement has always been there, even our higher level decision makers, coordinators, we didn't even think about it. We were not aware that this requirement was black and white and in place. So would you agree that this protocol just kind of brings light and guidance for agencies to follow very simply? Absolutely. It provides direction for the providers and making sure the provider understand that it's their relationship with their license with Dr. McGraw. And that's really where it's at. It's not the agency's relationship with Dr. McGraw. It's not the agency's relationship with the medical control. Dr. McGraw is the medical director. He oversees every EMS action that is done in Oakland County. He's the one that gives everybody the ability to work in Oakland County. And he has to know if there's been criminal charges or convictions. And this was buried deep, deep in a protocol, very difficult to find. And we just brought it to the surface to make it easier. Okay. So in this protocol, there's a few definitions right off the bat. There's charge and conviction. Can you guys please compare and contrast these two definitions? So you walked into a store and you picked up a candy bar and stuck it in your pocket and you walked out of the store, a police officer ends up coming after the store detains you for a second and you get charged with shoplifting. You've been charged. You then go to court, you go to trial and you're found guilty of shoplifting. You have now been convicted of shoplifting. That's the difference between charge and conviction. Okay, so it charges that formal accusation. It's the governmental authority that's asserting it, documenting it, and saying we have committed a criminal misdemeanor or felony. And it's really anything except for a civil infraction. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So, and that can include operating while under the influence. OWI is definitely something that if you're charged with and or convicted of, you got to report. Okay, so it's obviously two different things, and it's inclusive of a process. There's the charge that says you were caught or accused of doing something, and they have then applied legal parameters to you. You go through a process, and if found guilty, you are then convicted, and that's any plea of no low contender, a guilty plea, or plea agreement, including deferments as well as convictions after trial. So this is the result of those charges, I think is the best way to describe that. Yeah, that is 100% accurate. Okay, so now that I know the difference, the rest of the protocol, I think, becomes much more clear to the layperson and provider. 
So there's the procedure section. So Bonnie, what does the process look like from beginning to end? I get charged, I get convicted. They don't always happen on the same day. So play it out for me. Right. So it's really not the conviction, it's the charge. As soon as you have been charged, whether that results in an arrest or not, that charge is what makes it go into effect that you need to notify the Oakland County Medical Control Authority. It does say within one business day, but if you are arrested, don't make your one phone call us. Just let us know when you're out of jail. If you do get arrested, notify us in writing. We do need it in writing and let us know what happened and then we can go from there. I think one of the best practices maybe for our EMS coordinators or our managers of any type of EMS agencies to be aware of this. So when they are reported to that it happened to one of their providers, they can assure that this protocol is followed. And that even protects the provider by making sure it was at least declared. If there's already a charge, they're already in a situation that isn't fun. By not following this protocol doesn't make it any more fun. So it, it does add to it by all of us being socially aware of it. Okay, so we notify at least one business day. There's a little bit of leeway depending if you're detained and cannot make contact that way. John, what's the next thing? Well, the next step is the medical director, which is Dr. McGraw is contacted, and he has to make a determine right then whether or not the provider has to be temporarily suspended. I know what everybody's thinking right now. Whoa, I've just been charged. I'm not even guilty. Well, if you're charged with murder at that point in time, there's a reasonable expectation that the medical control has to take some steps and protect the patient. So if I'm tracking, John, the medical director looks at the initial information of the case to determine if this person is an appropriate EMS provider for the system, and it's case by case. Sometimes the charge may be completely unrelated to their capacity as that EMS provider, although there are certain things in criminal acts that can occur that we don't want that person interacting with our citizens. So it's a case by case basis that gets filtered through the medical director to determine if privileges need to be suspended immediately. So let's say they do not, or they do, either way, the OCMC then goes on to hold a more formal meeting. Tell me about that. Then we do a Sentinel event meeting. And what that is, a meeting of the Professional Standards Review Organization and the provider that has been charged. And that provider will come in and explain what has happened. Now, we also have an understanding that your attorney might tell you not to. If your attorney tells you not to provide any information, please put that in a letter back to the PSRO. So the PSRO knows that you've at least acknowledged that there was a meeting, and then they'll have to make their decision based on the information that they have. The Sentinel event meeting is a way for the PSRO committee to determine the depth of the situation and determine if further action needs to go forth. And as we said before, just like the medical director makes that initial decision, they review that again to assure, is this something we need to remove the person from going on EMS runs or not at that point? John, where can I find more information about Sentinel event meetings if I want to look it up? It isn't a protocol. It is in a protocol, and it is in the Complaint Investigation Resolution Protocol, and that is 8.27.1. So you can look up more details there to identify what actually happens in those situations. But after that Sentinel event meeting, Bonnie, the final step is that the PSRO committee has to notify the state of the situation and the results. Walk me through that process. So technically, it's Dr. McGraw that does this, but we work through PSRO. Dr. McGraw is part of PSRO. And so really, it's his name that goes on the documentation. And then we have to send that to the state. Whatever came out of that Sentinel event meeting, we need to let the state or Michigan Department of Health and Human Services know what happened with that particular licensed professional. That seems pretty straightforward. It is as clear cut as it sounds. And a lot of this comes out of, quote, the law. And we hear a lot of people kind of use that as a crutch to say, well, it's in the law. What I like about this protocol is it provides a reference of that law. So where can I find specific information about this requirement? Our law that we all operate under in EMS is the Michigan Public Act 368 of 1978. It's been amended twice. And we are really looking at parts 201 and 209. You can actually get it off of our website, ocmca.org, as well as the Michigan Legislature website. 
And I will be including a copy of a link to that as well for people to reference in the episode description. Perfect. Here's my final question on this protocol, Bonnie. Let's say I don't follow this protocol, meaning I don't notify the OCMCA, whether I know I need to or not, whether I'm aware of the existence of this protocol or not, what is the outcome of failing to assure I follow it? That is really the biggest part of this and why we created a protocol so our personnel do know about this. And the problem is, is it takes it out of our hands. If you don't disclose and notify us, we can't help you. And it'll go to the state and the state will most likely in most circumstances take away your license or at least suspend it for a period of time until things are sorted out. So we really want everybody to report this so that we can take care of it locally and hopefully, you know, take care of it so that we don't have to have anybody lose or have a suspended license. By not following this protocol, you are violating another protocol. What that can lead to is a suspension of your privileges for a possible temporary basis just for simply not following this protocol. And that was really what one of the big reasons we created this protocol or or brought it to the forefront was because we were informed that the state had been looking at people that have failed to follow this protocol and they were getting temporarily suspended for a period of time. And we don't want that to happen. You've had enough problems. Now let's get to the mitigation part. Yeah, and staffing shortages. I mean, they're bad enough. (laughs) All right, let's move on to the next protocol. Let's talk about more of an awareness of protocol 1-12, citizen assist, lift assist, which will be implemented on September 1, 2022. This is coming out real soon. Bonnie, let's start with you. Why do we need this protocol? Because the state law and rules require every call for service to be documented somewhere. Now, for EMS, that is an EPCR, Electronic Patient Care Record. This is not a new law. This has been in existence for the 26 years I've been here. It is just now coming to be where we know we have to have a protocol that speaks directly to this requirement. And I can tell you as a former EMS coordinator, when I had inspections from the state, we were asked, please show me your citizen assist and show me a patient care record from your citizen assist. So I do know this is something that they are looking at at the state level. Okay. So is it safe to say that in an oversimplification that all medical calls for service require EMS to do two things? First, you got to really complete a patient assessment to determine if there's an illness or an injury, right? Is there a patient or no patient? Bottom line. And then when that's done, you got to document that patient encounter to the degree of your applicable findings. You know, I show up and I have crushing chest pain with a STEMI. I treat transport according to protocol. I show up and there's no complaint. Well, that's still an assessment. I've identified I have a patient. I identified they're not injured. And in this situation, they might just need help off the floor. It is still an assessment, but it's much more abbreviated without an emergency attached to it. I would argue that you've done an assessment when you walk in and find that person on the floor. You look at the patient sitting on the floor, you say, hi, ma'am, are you okay? She says, yes, you've determined she's alert. You've determined that she has a pulse and you've determined that she's breathing all in that one step. You didn't get a pulse. You didn't get everything else yet, but you've determined all of those things are there. If you walked in and found her laying on the floor and she did not answer your question, you have assessed her also and you'd go in a different direction. So what I'm getting at is you have completed an assessment when you walked in on these lift assist patients. So I guess a more articulate way to say it is like bottom line, a citizen assist or a lift assist is just one form of a medical call for service that ends with a refusal of care or transport. Yep. So that's bottom line what it is. So I think the biggest change is more socially that maybe this isn't done as objectively treated as a medical in the past. And I think this protocol has been designed to give a little bit more guidance. That's what I get from it. Would that be accurate? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So give me some more detail. We always say the PCR has to be. Okay. It's in the law. Got it. Why is it more important? Give me more buy-in. Why is the juice worth the squeeze to do it this way? Bottom line is decisions above us are made by using EMS data at all different levels of government 
everybody's making decisions based on EMS data that is really affecting you as a provider. Let me hit you with just one example. So we had about 300 or so citizen assists a year when I was in my other life. And if we weren't tracking them on an ePCR, that 300 wouldn't be going up to the national data set. So what? Well, if my 300 aren't going up and your 400 aren't going up and your 1,000 aren't going up and your 1,500 aren't going up, and that's just in Michigan, now that stuff's not going up to my MSIS so that they can make decisions on Medicaid funding. And then that's not going up to the national level and NEMSIS and CMS is not able to look and see, hey, EMS is really doing a lot of these things. Maybe we should provide them with funding. Part of the reason why there isn't funding for it now is there isn't enough data that shows that this is what we're doing. We understand that this is a huge part of what your agencies are doing on a day-to-day basis. And it's a shame that data isn't being piped up to decision makers to help maybe fund it in the future. So it is an action of a labor group doing a thing. And if it's not documented appropriately, you're not able to show that your actions are providing a service in that community. There's so many different ways to look at this. You know, we look at it from the patient perspective as well. Why would it be better for the patient for me to create this document about their lack of an emergency ailment? So just for one example, you run on somebody on a regular basis and you're not tracking the number of times that you go on that run on that particular patient. You're not doing justice for that patient because there's resources out there that that patient may be able to get if this is documented. The number of times that you've been on that call to that patient, we're really doing them a disservice by not providing that data. There's also the protection from litigation. If you went on a citizen assist, you didn't document it anywhere, it didn't happen. So when that patient maybe has something worse go on 10 minutes later, two days later, and they say, oh, well, EMS was here and they didn't do anything. Now you've not documented that you were even there. Litigation-wise can be really bad for the agency and for the provider. You could have done everything right. You could have walked in there, talked to the patient, checked out. And if you just did an NFERS report on it, and that's a fire report, and didn't get a patient refusal, and two days later, that person ends up having a stroke or something really bad, doesn't matter to some attorneys whether or not they can tie a straight line to it. But if they can tie some sort of line to it, you might find yourself having to answer some questions. Okay, so this protocol has not been implemented yet, but it has been vetted through. It has gone through the process. Bonnie, when and how was this protocol developed and when will it be implemented? So we worked on it this year, basically, because we really wanted to make sure we were working out all the bugs or foreseeable issues with the protocol. So we took our time really developing the best protocol we thought we could, got it through our system, our protocol approval process up to the board of directors and then up to the state, and it's been approved. And we wanted to get some information out and some education out, which is why we're doing this today, one reason, and to let everybody know what's going on with this. And that will be implemented September 1st. And if I got any questions, who do I reach out to? First, I'm going to go ahead and guess you're going to say the agency EMS coordinator. But then if you're the EMS coordinator, who do you reach out to? Could reach out to me or to John. We both were very integral in getting this protocol done and adopted. So if you have any questions, definitely reach out to your EMS coordinator. EMS coordinators, please reach out to one of us. That is all for the show today, everyone. Thank you to Bonnie and John for joining me to provide an overview of the OCMCA Roadshow, as well as walk us through two new protocols. Please email us your feedback and tell us what you think about the show, or send us ideas for future episodes to Jeff, that's G-E-O-F-F, at O-C-M-C-A dot org. Thank you for listening to the MedControl Monthly Podcast, providing the latest updates, information, and trends to and on behalf of the EMS agencies and hospitals of Oakland County, Michigan. Have a great day.